just want to say, I've been to some venues on book tour. They are not like this. <laughs> I'm very glad to be here. Well, it's a thrill, as Ann said, to have you here. I'm kind of sitting here right now talking to you uh, because you uh, gave me a break. And I think tonight we can talk about how you get a break and what that break might looks like, look like. Later in the evening, we're going to bring up a couple of people to sit in a chair and pitch Terry McDonald as if you were in his office, a magazine story. And we'll talk, and um, it'll be an experience, I think, that'll approximate the real thing. So, um, but first, I want to talk about The Accidental Life right here, which is, uh, will be, Whatever we don't talk up here, we'll be talking about in the lobby afterwards while Terry signs this book. Um, what's it about? What's The Accidental Life about? Uh, it came, I wanted to write about uh, what I knew, which was editing uh, and writing and editing writers. And uh, <clears throat> I realized that why I wanted to do that was because uh, uh, like a wave of vanity had caught up with me over my years as, as an editor of, of relatively celebrated writers. I wanted to show myself as a writer. I wanted to show the writers I had edited and everyone else that I could do this too. That was the vanity. Uh, and I thought the best way to do that would be to write about writers I knew because I had detail uh, not just the getting under the hood part of editing them and how different they were and how similar at the same time, but also what they were like in the writing life, what that life was like, how uh, their eccentricities, what they wanted to talk about, how Jim Salter would never, never talk about himself, but then he would uh, keep meticulous records of touch football games and send for all of us who played in the games as if they were somehow important, even though, even, but they made the games more fun. And he did this instead of ever talking about his life as a fighter pilot. And there were, there were, there were many, many meanings in that for me and other things like that. And, uh, you know, it was the, uh, it was the life and uh, it was mine. Why accidental? Well, the idea there was that you could be on a career track as a journalist. You could get a job at a paper, get on a beat. You could work your way up, and and then in the end, you would be higher up, but basically at the same place. And the, the guy who made me an editor, a guy named Bob Sherrill, uh, suggested that that was the wrong way to look at it. You wanted to have as many different experiences as you could, and you wanted to bounce around because the joy of, and he coined the expression, the accidental life soars compared to the predictable. And what he meant by that was that it's okay to get fired, it's okay to quit even without having another job, and it's okay to take chances. And if you have the nerve, that will serve you well. And I think for, for me that was, although it scared me sometimes, it served he, me. He had a motto that was important to you, didn't he, about... Um he used to talk about uh, monkeys jumping out of boxes. As that was a metaphor for writing, I mean for editing. Get the monkeys to jump out of the box. I never saw those monkeys in your office. But well, you were, you, were, you were creating the monkeys. <laughs> well, your monkeys I needed to get leaping. I got to say, this is... Go on. Yeah. That, 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 <laughs> it, it's the other thing he would say would be, you, you know, there's a... You know, there's, there's got to be a zebra at the bottom of that Cracker Jack box, <laughs> or a Cadillac, you know, or something. Um, there was for you. <laughs> this is really, uh, I, for a couple, I, I've got about three things I want to say at once, but one, this is an amazing book. It, I, if you like reading just about people, if you like reading biography, this book is for you. If you like the gossip of the writing life, and we have so many writers in the audience, and there, Terry in this community. This is a book about writing. If you like Stephen King's book called On Writing, this is kind of in that vein in that if you kind of read between the lines on this, what you're really getting is it's as if you woke Terry up at three in the morning and he started kind of telling you all your secrets about 
what I would like to see in the piece that you're supposed to write for me. That's how I read your book. You know, I, I thought I was getting a peek behind the curtain about the, the editing process, which was very valuable. So, um, well, and, at least it's not Stephen King talking about himself. No. He's not in the book. Have you, did you ever meet him? Sure. Yeah? Okay. Um. <laughs> no, he's fine writer. I just, it never, what I was doing and what he was doing never aligned. Um. He's writing bestseller after bestseller. <laughs> okay, so everyone, this is like having uh, Gordy Howe on stage if you're a hockey fan or, uh, or uh, uh, you know, it, this is truly six degrees of Terry McDonald. So you, you're looking at Terry and you see Gay Talese or Hunter Thompson. Do you have any Hunter Thompson fans in the audience? Yeah. So there's uh, just a wealth of information here in this book about all those people. I think um, the thing I want to talk about Cheryl was that I think you wrote somewhere in here about, you write beautifully, uh, it was a way to live, don't get locked in, take life as it comes, the future and past together in the same moment. moment. And then Cheryl says to you, the other Bob Cheryl was right about an ITAL, about letting life happen to you regardless of the pain and so on, but with its soaring joy. The accidental life was good that way. Um, I never sensed that when I came into your office. You know, what I always sensed was, and I, I, didn't, I wouldn't expect to, but... <clears throat> Hunter once told me, he said, the problem with you as an editor is that you don't let on. You're having a much better time than the writers that you're editing. You know, I have and, to And we agree. resent that, you know. Yeah, no, it was very serious going into, uh, in, into your office when I would try to pitch you something. And, um, and I was uh, thrilled. I felt like I learned a lot through that process. But I didn't know that this was going on in your head. So that's what I mean by the book being almost like reading a diary in a way, which is its value. Um, uh, we've talked about the title. I, and just tell us where you you entered into journalism in American media post-World War II and really rode a wave to its peak, right? And well, I, I was a little late to the new journalism, but I, but I got there, and I had admired it, and uh, this was the, the usual suspects. And I got to edit them, Talese, Mailer, Tom Wolfe, Hunter, Plimpton, and I was in place, as we would say at Time Inc. and Time Warner, until 2012 in a real you know, line job, uh, which meant that the arc of my career was the arc of the rise of the new journalism and then the disruption of the, of the digital technology and then the, the uh, evaporation of viable uh, business models for what we had all loved the most, which was this now called the golden age of magazines. And it seemed to be a golden age uh, when I when I hit it, but now we're not in that age anymore. And you actually, though, had an early experience with Steve Jobs, kind of at the dawn of this new era. And I wonder if you could just explain, because I think a lot of people are concerned about how they're consuming news today and what even news is. And you saw you saw the early signs of Jobs coming in with his computer. Well, I, I love Steve Jobs. Yeah. Steve, Steve was uh, when I met him, he was wearing a tiny little bow tie and an extremely well-cut uh, English suit. And this, you know, I knew where this Steve Jobs was from. I was from 20 miles down the road in the Santa Clara Valley. He's from Cupertino. Um, I get that, you know, and, I, and, and there he is. And he's so young and he looks so good. And we're at a, a, a restaurant, a, a Washington Post reporter named Tom Zito brought him to dinner. And, and we had dates and, and Steve did not. And we started talking about what he was doing. And he was in town to show people the first Macintosh computer. And uh, he talked about it in such a loving and uh, uh, sort of intuitive way that you just knew he was going to be successful. And what he was saying was this thing, this was going to be uh, you're going to be able to shop on it. You were going to be able to get your mail on it. There was going to be all this communication. It was going to be entertainment. It was going to be all these things, which, of course, at the time, 
what, what this was not clear, but all of which became true. And I, the, uh, I remember uh, the, the women we were with just were, they thought Steve was great. And uh, we're looking at him, we said, What are you going to call it? He said, Macintosh. If you like the apple? And he said, Duh. <laughs> which was another side of Steve Jobs, which I got to know later. Because when we, over all of these years, we sort of kept in touch. We, I once did a, uh, one of the, <laughs> One of the swimsuit models was photographed once naked, except for an iPod. And we had that picture. We were not going to run that picture, but I sent it to Steve. So it was like really bad, bad boy behavior. But, but in, in, when, he, when he developed the iPad, we thought that that was going to save magazine journalism, because if we could only figure out a way to make magazines work on there. And I did the first one of those. And we did it without a, without a Macintosh computer because Steve wouldn't give us one because of the way Apple's always locked down. We gerrymandered something and we had a touch screen, we could do it and we, we had this prototype. And when Steve came to uh, Time Inc. to meet with all the editors and the people who run that company to introduce it, he passed it out. We all had one and by that time, a, a video that we had done that starts, hi, I'm Terry McDonald, editor of Sports Illustrated, and here's your new issue, and it was all on the iPad. And um, someone played that, and it ran, and someone asked him, hey, you know, you know what we've got going on here? And we were all thinking it was gonna be a time for Steve to really tell us how much he liked this. And he said, yeah, yeah, I've seen that. I think that's really, really stupid. <laughs> because it, was, it was, wasn't live. And I said, well, you couldn't, you know, we didn't have a, you know, we didn't have one of your appliances, I, he hated that word, one of your appliances to, to learn on. And he said, well, yeah, it's just, it's been, the meeting was over, we all filed out. And uh, Then I heard about two hours later, get this call, he said, well, you know, that was all kind of a negotiation in there because they, were, they wanted us to give up the names of our subscribers in order to get on the iPad and the Apple Store. So that's how I know Steve Jobs. This is the point in your career when, because there are two parts to your career, I think, the more executive designer developer side, right, in, in this era. Well, that was more recent. But then there's the part where you were in the trenches working with these writers at Rolling Stone and as Ann said, in places that you ran, you just weren't at the top of the masthead, but you were, you were. No, I was at the top of all those mastheads. Uh, but I mean, you were, but you were, but you were. That's important. Yeah. I mean, no, you can't, you have to, you have to have the ability to do what you want to do, or you, you can't had, do it. <laughs> um, yeah, mastheads are important. If you don't know, it's, it's the pecking order on the magazine, and it's, uh, every writer looks and see who's, who's who. Uh, and it's always a sad day when you get kicked off the masthead. Um, I don't know, it hasn't happened, wink, wink. Um, right. <laughs> um, uh, but to go back to working with writers like Jim Harrison, who many in the audience know, or Hunter Thompson, or tell, just in maybe New York in the 80s, you know, it's another world completely where we're living today. What was it like to be uh, riding this wave of journalism in the 80s in New York? Well, it, the, um, for me, it was about these people that I was working with because I, 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 you know, I became friends with them or friends, friendly with all of them, really friends with some of them. And they, they were very, very different. Um, but there was a subtext to the, everything that they all did. And they shared that subtext, which was that they all knew that we were all really lucky to be doing what we were doing no matter how much we complained about it, and there was a kind of a joy in that. So it was joyous when Jim would tell me, for example, you lynched my baby, um, by way of complaining about somebody inserted a, uh, uh, a semicolon into his copy. And you know, we can, you know, we can continue to be friends, but our professional relationship is finished. <laughs> it was. Hunter, you know, Jim would say that he had thought everything through so carefully before he sat down to write that when he wrote it, it was perfect. He was a poet, and editors don't edit poetry. 
So how could you possibly think, let's, you know, let's talk about what we're going to have for dinner. So that was Jim. Way over on the other side, uh, Jim Salter would, would be, was so hard on himself about that same semicolon. He would be in, it would be out, it would be in, it would be out, it would be whatever, that you just, with him, you just sent him to the galleys and then had him do your work for you. And it was, and then and, and he was, he was, he was prickly, but he was very careful. Jimmy Buffett did not care. He just, he, he had a natural voice and a, he knew who he was and he, he was grateful for editing. I would like scratch across all of his copy and move stuff around. He'd say, oh, that's, that's just great. Which I, I thought, I took as a, as a, it was a reflection of the great confidence he had in his own talent because he knew what the voice was and he knew who his, who his readers were and, and it played, this was when we first started together, way before he'd written any books, novels, or Where's Joe Merchant or any of that. So uh, what was the story of the 80s? You know, I mean, if you, as an editor, look back and say, okay, I, I published really six kinds of stories probably in my magazines, you know, what were they? Well, the 80s were, from my point of view, the much wilder decade than the 60s. Um, at one point in the 80s, I was on uh, Saturday Night Live when I was the editor of Rolling Stone, and it was, I, when they, the way they would introduce that show would be, you know, live from New York, comma, the most dangerous city in the world, comma, it's Saturday Night Live. And everybody there was kind of proud of that. And they showed all these street scenes and there were a lot of cocaine and, and it, was, it, was, it was, you know, dark noir streets and it would be completely black and then you would open the door and there would be this wild club scene going on inside. And um, it, just, it just felt very alive. And uh, all of the writers that I worked with had their own particular takes on that and were you know, totally devouring it as, as subject matter. Right. Um, uh, what, what are we doing, if you were to sit back and you're flying over the United States and you look down and say all the magazines are laid out on, on, across from New York to San Francisco, and you could just absorb and say, this is the story America's trying to tell itself right now. And it's kind of a broad question, but I'm really fascinated by stepping back as an editor and picking out themes that, might, that people seem to be uh, obsessed with or writing about or want to read about. You know, is, is there, is there, can you answer that question or is it just too broad? I, let me answer it this way. I read in The New Yorker this morning in the talk of the town, there is a little item about the, the very famous public intellectual in France who has started a magazine called America. And it's going to run, there's going to be six issues of it, and it's about America from the point of view of France, explaining America to the French. Um, which, if you think about it, is another Saturday Night Live skit, but, <laughs> but it's, it's also... Uh, exciting as an idea that they would do that and they want to answer your question how we would answer that for ourselves uh, has to be equally ambitious and what is what is not encouraging is I don't see a lot of media attacking it on such an ambitious level once we have determined you know with that that class divides are spreading out and that uh, hillbillies are cranky and that, you know, all of these things that are constantly talked about on, on uh, cable television now and that our president is, is, is problematic. And anyway, the, the once we, there's, no, there's not a lot of big projects about, you know, where, uh, where the heart of this country is. And you get to that by sending great writers into it to find it. Uh, and then, you know, coming back and making sense out of that, and you know, the creative literature, that is journalism too. It, so it's like de Tocqueville's come back. Uh, France is once again, kind of taking the measure of America. Well, uh, you know, I mean, we all talk about how much we, how smart de Tocqueville is. Yeah. Uh, you all go back and read that guy. It's 
<laughs> it's not a sharp. Be better. Well, no, I mean it was it was it, it, it's a naive, but sort of heartfelt uh, bouquet to uh, democracy. But it's it's showing off, you know, French democracy at the same time. It's constantly comparing. I prefer Hunter's version, which is what. Well, fear and loathing is one thing, but there has to be joy at the bottom of that because we're up against it, you know. You know, live. Tell people what fear and loathing is because not everyone in the audience may, have know, may know what that book meant or means in well, literature. Just the words fear and loathing had such a magical poetic ring when Hunter uh, coined them. And it started with fear and loathing at the Kentucky Derby. Uh, a piece that ran in Ramparts, where he first started working with Ralph Steadman, who was the illustrator who sort of defined the graphic thinking of his work, too. And, it, and uh, Hunter was from Louisville, and it was, for him, the full flowering of Southern degeneracy mixed with uh, corrupt police and just this horrible... And in the Kentucky Derby had been... You know, you did not say a bad thing about the Kentucky Derby. And then there was that piece, and everyone read it, and people who even loved, loved the Kentucky Derby said, that, that's the Kentucky Derby, and that is funny. And, and then, it, then, he, then he went to politics, and then there was fear and loathing on the campaign trail. And, of course, fear and loathing in Las Vegas. And then it, it picked up, and now it's, it's part of the culture. What was the, what's the line with the bats? What book is that? That's fear and loathing in Las Vegas. We were just out of Barstow when the drugs kicked in, or something like that, something close to that. You know, so who's doing that work today? Like, is there a magazine that you like that is uh, probing? I think the New Yorker is running a lot of interesting stuff online as well as in the, in the, in the physical magazine. Uh, yeah, there's, there's stuff going on out there, but it's not, it doesn't crackle quite the same way because we have so much news. Uh, and it's so homogenized, it seems. Uh, you can, uh, you can, you know, you, if you're in front of that fire hose, you know, you're going to get all wet. And uh, you, you maybe really want something else from time to time. Can we have too much news, you think? I mean, well, we can have too much, too many alternative facts. Yeah. <laughs> that, well, that that's hilarious. You know... I, you know, I always think about what Hunter would do with that. It, you know, it's like... So what do you think Hunter... What's the story Hunter Thompson would write for, your, for the issue of Rolling Stone if you were editing it this January? Well, you would talk him... I mean, you could talk... I talked him into going down to do the Pulitzer trial by explaining that America did not understand that it had become a tabloid nation and that he had to help us with that. The Pulitzer trial was about a divorce case between the heir to the great Pulitzer fortune and a young woman who was married to him and they, they, they all, it, with, at, in Palm Beach, and they all had sex and did drugs with each other, all the same people, and it was all over the tabloids and Hunter said, well, yeah, and I'll be staying at the Breakers, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and he did. Which man expensive, yeah. Yeah, and he said, I am, I'm in my convertible now and the the gales are lashing the palm trees and the birds are screaming and I am driving with the top down and two lesbians are drinking champagne and telling each other jokes in French. <laughs> it's a, that was something he wrote to you? That's the lead of that story. <laughs> no, that's, well, I mean, it's almost. I mean, his political incorrectness was profound. But, but he would always turn it and be on the side of who he was incorrect about. Right. And so that's the way he got, well, how he got away with Do you remember where you were when you read that uh, lead? Were you at your desk? or in What, what, what happened you? there was I, had, I, had, I left Rolling Stone and went to Newsweek. And, but Hunter was so tricky that when he filed things to, uh, to David Rosenthal and Jan, who took over, um, he would secretly file them to me, too. So I got that coming on a fax machine, like 11.30 one night, the same time he was given it to Rolling Stone. Guy would have been gone for four months. Wow. His deadline stretched out. Um, well, obviously that's a story. We can t why don't we talk about what makes 
a story like that by talking about some of these pitches that the audience has provided for us. You have your copy there. Um, we're going to try this. Uh, it's a new interactive feature of the National Writer Series. Um, uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, you've done a great job. Thank you. Um, all right. Is this right? Yeah, we're going to do this right here. Um, we solicited these, and I think if anything, of this, both this book and this evening is about getting to the heart of what makes a story. Um, and I think by thinking about that, it helps us clarify ourselves in a lot of ways, like what's our story? Not just the one we want to write, but what's our story? And it's hard to say, and it's really hard to say what makes a story. So we've had a couple of brave people email Ann Stanton, and we're first going to start with um, Joseph Morayo. Am I pronouncing your name? Are you here, first of all? And uh, if you are? Morio. Joseph, are you here? All right. Joseph, would you come up to the magic uh, wooden stairs to your future? I want, I want to say something, though, that this is uh, uncomfortably like a, a TV show that I loathe. <laughs> no, you have to come up. Which TV show is that? The Apprentice. Oh, the Apprentice. No. oh, my God. No, 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 no. <laughs> well, you know who that makes you? <laughs> that was my point exactly. <laughs> no. Um, so, hi, Joseph. Hello. I'm Doug. Uh, nice to meet you. This, 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 yeah. This is from my privilege. No, oh, no. Yeah. Um, this is seeming like a TV show. Now, Joseph, if you don't win this evening, we do have an all expenses paid. <laughs> it's a weekend in Sutton's Bay. I hope you enjoy it. Um, so you've written this pitch, uh, which uh, Terry Redden thought was cool, and I'm just going to read the first paragraph, and then why don't you just take it from there? And the point of this is to have you have a look behind the curtain about what it's like to be in an editor's office and get some feedback, and maybe it'll be helpful to you. So I'll read it just because maybe in the third, another voice it'll sound, you'll hear it differently. The working title of the article I'm proposing is, quote, Show For Me. I drove limousine in Palm Springs, California from the early 1980s into the 90s. I had a front row seat for the decade of decadence. It was a time when a seasoned driver would carry a small mirror with him so his clients in back won't be chopping on the woodwork with razor blades. <laughs> That's the first paragraph. Um, let me go on to the second. I'll be using the familiar format of a day in the life with anecdotes and observations about some names you will recognize. So, um, how do you want to do this? You know, I don't know. I mean, it just, it just struck me as something that uh, I could lash together and drag out of you and run in any number of different magazines with a different point of view because it has this inside information, probably, by paragraph two, I'm thinking, probably about some well-known people and then on paragraph three, I realized that Bob, I learned that Bob Hope was really cheap and never tipped. And then I've got Malcolm Forbes and Elizabeth Taylor and all of this as the thing stretches out. Well, I wanted to uh, save the big names for the last. I was going to use the day in the life and I basically was using, well, what I termed the bachelorette party from hell and then use the antidotes you know, as you go along, and there would be pauses in the stories, like how one of the antidotes, Bob Hope was loathed by the limo drivers in Palm Springs because he always wanted his cars comped, he never tipped, and don't even think about an autograph or a picture. And so it was always a new guy that was driving Bob Hope. <laughs> well, yeah. And I, then you'd go up and you'd go, expect a big tip. But, the, but the, there's that, and then there's, you know, you do not mention cocaine, but you so cleverly dodge around it, I realize that you can write a little bit. And this is nuanced, so this is, this is a story that I would assign at Rolling Stone like that. Well, thank you, sir. Yeah. Wow. 
How am I supposed to come back to that? <laughs> no, you, you know, you're... <laughs> but why does it make it... What's, what is the story, Terry? I mean, well, so we've... You've got to use the mic. Yeah. It, it has disclosure. It has a kind of glamour. It has celebrity. It has, you know, weirdness. It has, it has decadence. It has, you know, day in the lifeness of it. Or I mean, it just all of the things sort of keep rolling on, and it's 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 not well. How many words is the story? Because that tells that would that tells us where it's going to be in the magazine, right? Where would you place this? You could play this story a bunch of different ways, depending on how long you wanted to go with it. You really could. What would make it a great story, though? I'm not. I don't. You know, I don't know you. I think I like it. I kind of feel like I've heard this story in some way, but I wonder, I think it could be a great story, but I don't know what would make well, it Well, that great. would be my job to pull the uniqueness out of there so there would be things that even a sophisticate like you would be surprised by. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Well, I'm still... Uh... And... Um... What did you think of my closer with Malcolm Forbes? I thought it was great. Um, that made me like it even better. Um, I didn't like your come behind the velvet ropes. That's quite cliche to me, but you know, Drive, Joseph Drive was good. Right. That's when they're, he's, Malcolm Forbes is springing Elizabeth Taylor from, uh, the, Betty Ford from the Betty Ford Clinic. And this is, this is the, this is, <laughs> he's driving the getaway car. <laughs> All right. Very good. So thank, thank you, you very much. All right. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. you want to talk about your pitch? My what? You want to talk about your pitch? My, the real, which one? The first one. Um, you don't have to. No, I do. Uh, and then your duplicitousness about John Mellencamp. Yeah. Well, you know, what I liked about Joseph is, you know, when it, you hear those words, I like it, I'd run this in Rolling Stone. You hear that, your hair goes back, and then your first thought is, oh, sh I can't, how am I ever going to do this? But that's when you smile and say, well, that's no problem at all. I just know how to do this. And that's exactly what I did with you. You just learned this, but um, I had no interviewing experience whatsoever. I was been a, quote, poetry uh, poet. Let me set this up for you. Okay, all right. <laughs> Um, I get a letter wait, from... Wait. he's always editing, isn't he? He's no, editing. no. I get a letter from Jim Harrison, says, I never do this, but a good friend of mine's kid's not too bad. And then I get a letter from, you know, from Doug, and the kid is not too bad. And he writes this essay that Ann talked about. And then we say, okay, we'll give you an assignment. And I think, hmm, the Midwest... John Mellencamp, there must be a connection here. So I, we call Doug and say, what about John Mellencamp? And I didn't hear it on the phone the way I should have because he was saying, I wonder who John Mellencamp is. But what he said was, great, John Mellencamp. Back I to did. you. Yeah, back to me. Actually, um, I, I was in your office. and um, All the worse. Yeah. <laughs> and you said, hmm. That was not, that was okay. Uh, what do you think? And so I, I said, I love him. Man, he's my favorite singer in the world. I've got every album. And then you said, really? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you were surprised that really about any of that. Maybe I was a bit over the top. And you said, well, listen, go see if you can make it happen. I had no idea what that meant. But I went out to the, you gave me a, a Kathy Shanker's phone number as publicist. So I went out, this is the days of pay phone. I went out into your hallway and I dialed her number, and I said, hello, this is Doug Stanton calling from Esquire, which is true. I had just arrived there 20 minutes earlier, but I, w <laughs> but I was calling from Esquire, and, um, and I said, we'd love to do a cover story of John Mellencamp. I didn't know if it was a cover yet. I figured it would be. She goes, really? And I said, yeah, are you, are you? She goes, we're interested. So I hung up and then went back into your office. You were actually doing something else by then, and uh, I said, you know, they're in. You go, oh, great, you got the job. You know what else? What? I just realized the one thing we never did, writers could never do, was promise a cover. <laughs> <laughs> because if you promised a cover, then you would promise a cover, and I always wanted to keep 
the word of the magazine, and you could not do that. You could not work for me and promise covers. And there well, you did. I wasn't really working for you yet. I had just kind of... <laughs> I was trying to get the job. I did not know this. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> that's, this, that's the issue with the Jim Salter story from American Express with the woman on the cover, and he had this great uh, spread inside of Mellencamp painting his face. But, uh, yeah, that was fun. But um, I think I got paid 5000 bucks, but my expenses were about... $28,000. Those were the days. You got 10 and or at least seven. No, I got few. five. I was here painting the nursery, and I thought, man, I'm never going to have to work again. This 5000 bucks is going to go so far. And then, I, and then I woke up, and I realized, oh, man, it's already half gone, and that's when you put me on contract. And I got this gig, but that's really how it happened. Which begs this other question, how do writers make it today? You met with the Front Street writers today. I don't think they could do it. I, they couldn't scam you the way I just did, or anybody. So what are they supposed to do to make a living? Well, that's unanswerable, but also, you know, you can, you can carve it up. The, the ones who are most successful now coming up the fastest think of themselves as, as brands, and they will do a piece for $3,500 for Harper's in order to get on a television show that'll pay them $500 an appearance if they can hook up with CNN or some point. And they will tweet so that they can, their audience will be bigger. And it's about disseminating the news, but it's also about that brand building. And, um, and that works for a lot of people now, that, but it, it encourages a kind of intramural competition, which is like what we're seeing now, the coverage of Washington, and you can be preoccupied with that as opposed to actually doing the journalism. But if you think about it, that kind of brand building was at the heart of the most successful writers that I dealt with in the, in the 80s, 70s, 80s, like Hunter and George Plimpton and, uh, and all of them, you know, Tom Wolfe, Talese, all those guys, you know, had something like that. The, the, and I think a reason for the solidarity that they felt, and it wasn't just that they were running into each other in green rooms, it was that they recognized that the other one, that the rest of them, that some of them, they, in each other, they would recognize this persona that had been built that was not quite real. And that living in it was not always that comfortable. And... That could account for a lot of the drinking, or I mean, I, I just I don't you know we don't want to go down that road right now. But but they um, it wasn't it wasn't always it wasn't always wonderful. But it seems thinner now on Twitter than you know it did. Right. It, hmm. Does that make sense, Doug? It does. I hadn't thought that the the white suit of Tom Wolf and the cigarette oh, yeah. the cigarette holder of Hunter Thompson. Uh, uh, we could go on was really their form of social media, because yeah, of, you could you had to see it and there the, was you, know, you manipulate imprint. media, yeah. mani of manipulation of what you're a part of. So that's it, kind of what I'm doing here, selling this book. Right. Um. It's it's just it just seems cheaper today though, because you're all, the publisher always wants you to go on Twitter and Facebook and constantly promoting yourself and tweeting, you know, and you hire people to tweet in your name, and it's, it's just a different, I don't know. It's it doesn't always feel right if it's not authentic. And the, the, the best advice that I ever got it, over all these years, over all the different things, and what I tell people is that if it's not authentic, people can tell that. And when they can tell that, uh, they do not like it. Have you ever sent an authentic tweet? Um... I had a position, on, we, I was very early uh, into Twitter, but I, I couldn't, I didn't want to be the editor of Sports Illustrated doing a lot of that. I wanted to have remove, and I wanted all my writers to tweet their opinions and their whatever, but I didn't want to have a, a voice right. for Sports Illustrated that I would have been because of my position in the thing. So has I, the and I haven't really. What? Has the medium become kind of the message? You know, you've got these people at MIT who's, you've told me with algorithms, they think they can engineer journalism. I mean, a tweet is not news, or is it? News 
Well, you break news on any platform you, you, you want. I think there's, I have a couple thoughts about this. One is that there's, a, there's an MIT class where uh, uh, journalism is taught as an engineering problem. This is ambitious, I like it. Everything that I learn about that from Joey Ito and these people is, is fascinating to me. But at the same time, I see the strongest, most, uh, really the bravest originally, big traditional media companies being brought down by a lack of, of innovation and creativity. And that lands when, because the business plan is not working or faltering, you've got to cut costs. So where are you going to cut those costs? Well, not from your digital development because you know you got to do that now and it's all, that's also really very much cheaper. But you've got these very expensive editors over here who are supposed to be doing all this creative nuanced uh, packaging work and you know whatever it is they do besides ride around in the radio cars that you buy for them or pay for and, and, and so they go. And they are replaced by people who believe they were replaced more and more by people who believe that you can, in fact, engineer creativity or engineer, uh, you know, the best journalism, and you cannot do that. It it takes the packaging. It takes it takes more than that. And as it the stuff comes out the other end, it becomes more and more homogenized. That's why when you're on on the web, all of these headlines seem the same. And that lead that we got from Hunter, that's not going to appear anywhere. And it's just, there's, just, there's just the sameness to it all. And that's one reason why some of the magazines that are still working out because people will pay for them, and they should because there's high quality, that's, you can still find that stuff. But that, we're right in that right now. I hope that doesn't sound bitter because I'm a, really a digital developer but now. But well, here's ouch. <laughs> Well, here's a story that is somewhat within this universe. Um, uh, is Lon Cameron here? Can the lights come up? Um, are you here? Come on up, Alon. Um Terry, Alon has this other, it, she's that, um, dear millennials, you get a bad rap? Yeah. I was just reading the first, hi. Hi there. Hi, it's such a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's mine. Hi, Laura. Hi, nice to see you. Um, okay, well listen, why don't you just give us the, 30, the elevator speech here and then, because we, uh, it's, a different, it's a different kind of pitch. Sure, um, which one did you pick? The first paragraph. Okay. Because uh, <laughs> I kind of thought you would like the name of the second one which was um, children are f trophies, but. <laughs> I do like it, but it does not a great story make. Oh, I'm sorry. It's very predictable. Oh, fair enough. The chapped hide of an yeah, angry yeah, lesbian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obvious. Um, so the story is uh, writing a kind of apologetic love letter in a way to millennials because they're so misunderstood. Like, every other generation that came before them. Yeah, but, but, but differently. differently. I think, I mean, I love the idea that you're playing around with, but I gotta talk to you about how you're gonna execute it. Okay. There was a, there was a, a famous series that ran in Esquire long before I got there, where uh, different writers of a different generation would, you know, of each generation would write about their generation. It came, was inspired originally by the Who song, My, My, My Generation, uh, really. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it, it allowed people with voice and a lot of attitude to throw a bunch of stuff out there that was enlightening for other generations and also for their own generation because of the detail and the stories they told. So if we were working together now, I would want to know, well, what, what story most... Um, exemplifies the frustration of your generation or the kindness of it or I would want that about everything what do you eat mm -hmm. I cook most of my own food yeah do you kill it first I could I'm right, not afraid but of I that but I would want to know where you stand on that right as a generation well 
I mean, are you the people that I'm brought us that gluten freeness? Probably. But you see where this can go as a story. There's, there can be. Well, again, one of the things that I think it's important to note is, and I, I'm not like giving myself a compliment here, is I look old. I look younger than I am. I'm 45, and so there's this aspect of my experience that is very much dictated by um, an extension of my young life, which was being Gen X, uh, this sort of beaten generation that was really trying to find hope after the Cold War childhood that we endured and finding this way to the idealism that some of our parents had. I often joke that I was raised by hippie wolves. So my stories are very much informed by my parents' extreme political leanings and um, they were white panthers and super involved in stuff. So my childhood was extremely interesting and colorful. So that made you a vegan? No, I'm not a vegan. I said I could kill my own food if I wanted to. No, well, you, but that was like a high curve you threw me. Sure. I, so I want to you know, keep fooling with that, with those ideas. I mean, because is there a vainer generation than yours? Than Gen X? Yeah. I mean, aren't you the ones who are always talking about I and you're talking about yourselves and, and that point of view and yeah. tweeting about yourself? Just, just everything is just... I thought that boomers were the me generation. I don't know. They, uh, Tom Wolfe called them that, but only because you guys hadn't arrived. <laughs> I mean, I think... Fair enough. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, how could I possibly, like, retort? But no, you... No, you, no I'm not giving you the microphone. No, no, no. What I, what I mean is if you go through this and start making lists of this stuff, you'll have a lot of really good detail. Right. And I think that there's an aspect of it that has a lot to do with this intergenerational um, awareness. It's like... Basically, like, you're, you're grown up now, okay, you're okay. So that's your lead, <laughs> right? Okay. Well, it gets, look, it got there, it got a laugh and attention. Mm -hmm. And if I put the right headline on that, vainest generation ever, or something, it wouldn't be that. But then, you know, you would be, you'd I be mean, rolling. I mean, I'd be okay with that. No, but yeah, of course you, you would, to. but we'd be rolling now. We'd be... And we could get through the story. We could get to about strange pets or whatever. Also, it's the way she said it. Yeah. You, you actually were writing the line right there because it was coming out of this place that wasn't really writing. Yeah. You know, and you just captured it. So, um, so you have an assignment also. Great. Go. Just talk to Doug. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. There, there are these, the Me Generation essays are collected you can find them, and that's what they were called. And um, I read them all; they're great. So, right. All right. Well, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, okay. I think you're great. It's it's kind of working out. It's not bad. It's, I think we'll get picked I don't up. No, I think we're season. like maybe a C plus up here with this. Oh, I think we're. What are we? C or B? A? Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, all right. Well, let's do one last one because uh, we talked about it. And this would be the missing person one? Yeah. Okay. Alexis Whitman, are you here? Can you bring the lights up again so we can? No one's still. Is Alexis here? No. Oh, you lose. It's like the State Fair. You're not here for the drawing. Um, okay. You have a plan B? Spearing? You've got a great thing about the spearing. The spear fishing. Oh, well, it's kind of like the last one, but sure. But wh why this was good was, uh, you know, this is, maybe this is reporting it's, it says, for years I've seen a classified ad in the lost and found section of our Record Eagle, which reads, Missing, Jacob Cabanaugh, last seen in TC, 33110, and then a, uh, an address. 
So who is Jacob and what happened? It's been running in the paper all this time. And so it he turns out that who he was. He knows a little about that. And I would want to I would want to know a lot more about this, but what was the only thing that was wrong with the 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 pitch was that he had not yet or Alexis is a, a woman, I think, had not yet uh, called the police and asked what they knew. Because that would unlock this story and then you could get an assignment to track this down. Because it's, it's really compelling. That runs every day or every week in the paper. Still. Pitches are hard. Um, I remember once I gave a pitch to you, I don't remember what it was about, but you said, you know, that's great, but I don't want to know anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, the the arrogance that you find yourself in the mirror when you do things like this is humbling. What? I mean that I would say that's great, but I don't want to no, know no. anymore. No, because what I did is I basically what you were. No, I appreciate it immensely because what I realize is you got to back off on the pitch. It's you got to tease the editor. You're not really telling the whole story. And I told the whole story, and basically what I had was a 500 word story that really didn't deserve to be 3,000 words. And you were telling me, think bigger, I think, you know. I hope I was, but. Yeah, you really were. Now listen, uh, um, we d I just want to touch on this, because uh, the answer to this one, and Brian Gartland, I think you're in the audience, but there was a spear fishing one, and you, uh, let me just read the lead, and then Terry had this great comeback. Uh, what would make it a great story? Um, uh, 200, um, he's, uh, it's called Spearing Dinner. Basically, 200 miles from Florida, the third largest barrier reef in the world separates the Atlantic Ocean from the shallow waters of the Bahamas. It goes on to talk about, you know, it sets it up. There's a lot of exposition. Not really getting to the story yet. But, um, Having spent winters in the Bahamas over the last 10 years, I've been in intimate with the reefs. This year I will sail them, and uh, I want to make it, I want to go free diving for lobsters and fresh fish, and basically take you around the Bahamas and the Abacos and kind of lead you by the hand in the way you would for Outside Magazine. Now that, we were talking about this, and I said, that's the story I've seen a lot. But then- well, No, the, the kicker in there, he just in order to make this more interesting, he wanted to take Doug Stanton with him. Yeah. Does he not? Oh, Brian, there you are. Oh, good. Yeah. Well. But you, you had a better idea. Well, I thought, you know, that would really work, and that lit another bunch of ideas in my head, but you just don't want to take Doug Stanton. No. That's the way you want to do a profile of a, some really high-end person who is really not identified with having any sort of expertise in you know in you know physical world stuff. Uh, there like a there's a Fran Leibowitz who is wonderful Fran. Uh, she uh, E Jean Carroll took her camping, uh, and it was wonderfully funny, and it it was a, a great way to do a profile of of of. Uh, Well, you oh, said, Fran, but I, I was just thinking, I mean, it, wouldn't it be great to, that would be an interesting way to do a, a profile of uh, Kobe Bryant in retirement. <laughs> no, take him spearfishing. But how? I don't know, you could plug in almost anybody and it gets interesting. The more, you know, the more uh, counterintuitive it is. And, that, and that's a thing that uh, a lot of editors do. It's a, it's a pretty standard trick, but uh, this, could work a lot of ways. So when Brian, bring up, can you bring up the lights, Michael? Just raise your hand, Brian. Um, there, it's a good, it's a great idea. It's nice to see you. But when you said that to me, Terry, so how does he get? I, I he actually said Jay Z. How do you get Jay Z to go on the spear fishing expedition? Well, you call up and you say, "Hi, it's me from Esquire, and I'm here to promise you a <laughs> cover story." <laughs> Yeah, or even, you know what, he does, and, or you could be, that would be a way to get to Johnny Depp, who is a big snorkeler, 
but who doesn't want to do anything with anybody but might go snorkeling with you if you could show him where he could dive and get those illegal lobster that you're, that twinkle in your eye is about, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's all you and the Allberries. All right, well, as long as we have the lights up, as long as we have the lights up, uh, let's take some questions from the audience. We have microphones roaming around. Just stand and say your name, please. Um, and we can finish this out, Brian, and during the Q&A if you want. Um, anyone? I, you got the front row here? Um, here comes a mic. One of the, uh, the best part of your book, which I read last summer when it came out, and it still intrigues me, is the part about James Salter and Peter Matheson. And you talk about them and how they lived together, their families dined together, they played football together, they swam in cold oceans together, they did all this together, greatest of friends. And yet, James Salter, who, great pilot, man's man, climb rock, I mean, he did everything, and yet he was so quiet. Yet he was afraid to let Peter read his stuff. What was that about him or about writers that, that, that what are they afraid of? Is that in the hope? That's, that's a what a great question. question. That the, uh, those two, I never, I never knew two writers, men really, that, I, that I've known in my life with better manners who were careful and courtly and also the most the two most competitive writers that I knew. I think that what you mentioned is in what I, the way when I was writing it, I was thinking about that competitiveness. They didn't want to show each other weakness. They wanted to, they counted money, although they would not talk about it. They knew their, each other's advances, although they would not talk about it. They kept, they knew everything, and their deal was not to talk about it, but to be friends in the real world in other ways because they were neighbors and they would talk about other writers and uh, other books and other ideas, but never their own. It was moving somehow to me. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that's a great question and a nice compliment, thanks. Um, someone else? Yes, right here. Oh, there's Brian. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I wondered about the uh, when you're talking to uh, when the Tom McGuane quote when he was talking about uh, I've done a lot of things I'm ashamed of, but I ain't never taught no creative writing. Yeah, <laughs> and he was talking about you were asking him about uh, the or talking about a couple sharp uh, writers who were t teaching at Missoula in Montana, and I was going to school there about that time, so I was wondering who those guys were. Well, um, I'll tell you, the, the, just to set that up a little bit, there was a time right then when you, if you were a writer from Montana or you lived in Montana, you got a kind of a free pass, both in New York and in Hollywood. There was a great, there was a great, a lot of, uh, there was just a lot of mystique around it, mostly because Tom was such a romantic character and so gifted and just so cool, you know, and so... He he was he was there he was uh, in Livingston with all those guys and they're they they were getting movie money and whatever, and then in Missoula there's the great Bill Kittredge, and Bill Crumley and 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 uh, um, the death of Jim Loney, the great uh, Blackfoot writer or Blackfeet. Uh, oh, James Welsh. James Welsh. This is just, I worked with all these guys. That was at the same time. And Tom, in a flip remark, uh, when asked about the, write, the Montana Writers School by a wire service reporter, said, well, I've done a lot of things in my life I ain't proud of, but I ain't never taught no creative writing, which, which caught on. And, and uh, people would use that as a kind of a badge when they were trying to write screenplays or whatever, and, and it was, it, it's still in the culture. Tom was embarrassed by it. But yet Tom went to the Yale School of Drama. Well, he, no, it flipped, he, he, 
he tossed it off flippily as a, as, a, as a kind of a joke, even in dialect. He had no idea that, he, that this was going to be the most famous Montana insult of the decade. But yeah. they all got over it. They're fans of each other's still. We have a question up here. Okay, in the balcony. Go ahead. Terry, um, your time at Time, Inc. brought you to Sports Illustrated, and I was just wondering uh, how you could characterize the culture over there and uh, Mark Mulvoy, if you worked with him at all, and his uh, kind of uh, uh, Boston ingrown culture there and his BC Mafia, did you have to penetrate uh, a wall there at, at Sports Illustrated? Sports Illustrated was a very tough place to go into, um, especially because I had not been a sports editor. But uh, Mark turned out to be a great ally of mine. Mark Mulvoy was, after Andre Laguerre, uh, the most successful editor of Sports Illustrated, and he was uh, from Boston, and he loved hockey, and he was hard driving and, and tough, and uh, he uh, hated the management of Time Inc. Just was just against everything they wanted to do. He wanted his own independence. So he, when I got there, I said something not particularly wise or sage about you know, the way the company's being run and I have to, we have to do some things. And he got right behind me and he said, Terry's right. Editors should run this company and he's the editor who should run it. And he was like, he ran interference for me. So it was wonderful. And it turned out I, w I was in my job, in that job uh, like a year longer than him. But we too have the record along with whatever. But th th that culture was a... a, a a business culture that was changing in the way that I thought that they were, they were running around thinking they were trying to catch falling knives, as they say on Wall Street. It was just, they're terrified, but they're looking for solutions. There was an editorial culture that was, you know, tight, didn't want to let anybody in, and this editorial was deeply suspicious of anybody inside or any of the new technology, and it had an IT department, which was emerging as one of the most important that were bitter because the other two groups thought that all they did was, you know, were responsible for the air conditioning or what happens if the elevators don't. So it was, it was completely dysfunctional. And uh, that's why all that trouble. You're talking about how things operate. Where, where are women in this whole universe now in 2017? Because, you know, they've, it's, I mean, and they're there. We have a mutual friend, Susan Casey, who won, you know, she, she's been here actually on this stage. So talk about that just for a moment, where, because women's magazines and men's magazines have had this. Well, the worst, the, the worst thing about it when I was starting was that women, you know, ran a lot of magazines as the number two or the number three. When I got to Rolling Stone, there was Jan who owned it, and there was me, and then there was one, two, three, four women. Who, uh, the, 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 the creative director, art director, the copy chief, the person who ran research, and uh, the number, the top f features that are all women. Uh, and the, 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 the most, I mean, it even sounds, uh, you know, cloying and kind of creepy for me to talk about it like this, but, you know, you just the 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 uh, they used to say, well, you know, she's a great she's a great number two. And if you had said that about a man at that time, it would have busted his career. But there was no consciousness, no awareness of this the way we were doing it. In the, and and as women uh, began to point this out, things began to change in the sense that there was more jargon about it but it didn't really change very much. And uh, if you go and look at those mastheads now, there are, there are some more women on the top of those mastheads, but it's nowhere 50-50. It's more like banking. You know, it's like 70-30 or something. Um, and at, when I started, a man ran all the women's magazines at Hearst. John Mac Carter was responsible for all of those, and he was considered a genius. It was like, they, women uh, occupied his office and smoked cigars and made him 
understand that they should maybe supply daycare or whatever. It was a huge, huge thing and uh, a big success in the women's movement. But, but it, there is movement forward. I mean, it's changing, I would imagine. Yeah, the problem now is that there aren't enough women in engineering, I think, in the way that the media is cracking. And that's kind of like banking, again. It's not, they're not, they're not recruited out of schools in the same way, or graduate schools, or, or, or whatever. As reporters, and uh, if you do a breakdown of graduate journalism programs, there are more women in those programs than men. Just like in law school, there are more women than men. But it's not reflected in the leadership. Hmm. Thank you. I've got a so, question over okay. here. Uh, where are you? Okay, thank you. My name is David Grath. Uh, <clears throat> I knew a lot of the writers that you've been talking about tonight, and uh, I met most of them in the 80s, and I'd done some hanging out in Key West and here and elsewhere. And I, I wonder what you think about the influence of cocaine on writing at that time. Because a lot of the people I knew were using cocaine, and it seemed like it was the development of the snark revolution. People were free to write in ways that were Mm. The collar was taken off in a way. Do you, how do you feel about that? I have a lot of complicated feelings about it. You cannot glamorize that, especially from this point of, from where we're standing or sitting. But I, George Plimpton and I went out to Woody Creek to interview Hunter for the Paris Review. It was the first writer at work for a journalist. And George's question that he, that he carried with him on all those interviews he did was, can you write under the influence of alcohol, you know, whatever? And he told Hunter that uh, that was the big question, and he pointed out people who said they couldn't write that way. And Hunter said, they lie. Who do you think wrote the book of Revelations? A bunch of stone-cold clerics? <laughs> and, you know, and on it went. Um, I think it was, it, it would work. You know, you could, you, could, you could get, you would do more words, like speed. There was a lot of speed, too. But it was so damaging, ultimately, to so many people that um, it was, became obsolete, kind of. But it was much different, I think, than the way we're having Oxycontin and heroin problems now. I don't know. I mean, I would have to be very careful with my language about that, but... But any addiction, you know, it's not good for me, I know. Thank you. Yes, Susan. Terry, welcome to Traverse City from Michigan Writers. I had a gentleman that came up to the table wondering about a free event next Friday. And wherever he is, I just want to tell him it's the National Writers event on page 17 in the program. But my question to you is, you mentioned about moving from being an editor to a writer, and I'm wondering, what have you learned? Uh, that it's lonelier than I ever understood it to be. You know, I, I was used to talking to a whole bunch of people every day. I was used to talking to, on the phone, into my office, lots of meetings, whatever. Now, me and my dog, it's a different thing. So I, you know, I, I modulate my life, well, especially when I was really trying to get this book done. And so I'm not a full-time writer. I'm too lonely. <laughs> okay. Uh, in the, to Ellen, then we'll come to, oh, well, yeah, whoever gets there first, go ahead. Okay, Ellen, go ahead. Um, I'm Ellen Polygian, and, um, I always wonder, I always think when I see a story that it pretty much came out that way after several drafts. And I saw James B. Stewart talk, and he was at one time with the Wall Street Journal doing those wonderful, long, and he, he said that um, you wouldn't believe the kind of copy that would come in and how much the editors did. And I kind of thought, well, that, <laughs> it's almost like unfair in a way as the editor that you're doing all this magic, but the writer gets all the acclaim. But also as a writer, um, I think you always just, I always feel like I, want, I, I don't want to feel like, I don't mind being edited, but I feel like I didn't do the job right if I'm 
heavily edited, and I know that's not necessarily the case, so I just wonder... Well, I think it often is the case. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's always very situational, but the best... I mean, editors, writers who edit themselves and keep going back and are almost compulsive about that are really wonderful to work with, and others are very, very sloppy, but by you know, the, what they've achieved in their career, or they have a, a knack for humor, or their ear is right or something, you can get away with it. There's just, you, there's no way to, to characterize them all with anything except sort of everything. But writers, uh, you know, have to work out what their pose is toward editors, the foot they want to get off on. Like, do they need editing or not? Harrison, never. Uh, Hunter used to file paragraph after paragraph of false leads that did not go together. Your job was to put them up on a wall over the course of the night and move them around and find a way that they would become a story. Completely different, wild extremes. Would you write the interstitial text? Yeah, yeah. but I say that I didn't. Yeah. With Hunter, I never remembered, but... Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, Jim Salter, you put an and in there, and he said, what's this and that came in? So I, had a, I just had a comma there. Yeah. What are you doing? Um, we have time for probably two more. Uh, we had one over here first, Meredith. Okay, go ahead. In your section on Dark Nights, I thought it was interesting how you talked about the dungeons and creativity or where they rage and how we could catch glimpses of it without recognizing. I was just wondering what, what you mean by that. Could you read that again just more slowly? <laughs> Maybe it is in those dungeons that creativity rages. Maybe we all catch glimpses of it many times without recognizing what we are seeing. Um, I'm referring to a passage uh, in Bill Styron's essay, Darkness Visible, which he wrote about his own depression. I went to, a, I was at a dinner party at Margot Kidder's house long ago, and the Styrons came. And, and Bill was depressed then, but not talking about it. And Pierre Trudeau was there pretending to be a waiter. With the, he was dating Margot then. And it was, it was, you know, kind of a interesting, you know, thing for me. I was like starry-eyed to be invited there and just to be, be part of that. And when we started talking about, you know, writers and whatever, McGuane was a big fan of Styron's and I suggested, I told Bill that and I did, he, and he said, no, yeah, he knew, but he was very quiet and internal and, and uh, at, at one point, Pierre said something like, well, tell us, Bill. What are you working on, and how's it going? And I never saw a question asked with better intention that landed with such devastating darkness. Because Styron said, well, we have to, we, Rose, we, we, we have to go now. And they drove all the way back to Connecticut, and I'm sure they were supposed to spend the night with Margot as in Steen's Landing on the Hudson River, New York. And then, I wrote this because years later, I am visiting in Livingston where Margot lives now and we're talking about this and uh, we were talking about how, you know, th these different suicides kept coming up. And she said, uh, well, a lot of us had that in us. So, I was haunted by that and then, so I recalled what Styron had said about that dark jungle. There seem to be, are you a writer who writes out of happiness the, or some sense of conflict? You know, like Wallace Stevens said he, W.H. Auden wrote in a very miserable mood and Stevens was the opposite. I think you're in a good mood when you want to show off and it works and when it's not coming, you should have gone to law school. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that's one more and then we'll adjourn to the lobby. Hi, yes, Meredith. It seems that the most important thing is an authentic voice that you're looking for in an author, yet you edited all these very disparate geniuses and made each voice unique. Could you talk a little bit about how you edit such different people and leave them themselves? 
Well, I think you. Yeah, I agree completely with what you said about voice, but you know, Hunter again, he he would say, "Let the big horse run," <laughs> or "Let the big dog eat," and that was the way. That was him saying, "Don't mess with my voice." And McGuane used to say, "Well, you know, Terry, I, I wrote that on purpose." <laughs> and you, and then you would think, "Wow, what am I? Am I undermining?" something that a, a great talent has thought through, and then you would feel bad and, and whatever. And well, well, Jim would just say, wow, you know, they don't edit poets. <laughs> Do you think you found your authorial voice? You have, you've had an editorial one for, for so long, and many of them. I don't know. Maybe not. It's hard. Yes. This, I could write this book at a distance because I was writing about other people. There's very little in there about me or me having opinions as opposed to me pointing out something that actually would happen or a detail of, you know, what hurt someone's feelings or, you know, where we all went. Well, listen, um, on that note about voice, let's say thank you and really thank you very much. Thank you.